Welcome. My name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJGA manager. And NAJGA, or the North American Japanese Garden Association, is an organization that's dedicated to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Thanks to support provided by the Japan Foundation, this series, inspired by Dr. Kendall Brown's book, Quiet Beauty, will focus on the history and development of Japanese gardens in the U.S. We continue today with part nine of our 14-part webinar series. Today, we'll explore the history and development of the Anderson Japanese Gardens in Rockford, Illinois, and we'll learn how the Anderson's backyard was transformed into a revered Japanese-style landscape. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters, Tim Gruner and Professor Kendall Brown. I know both Tim and Ken are very well known to many of you, but I'd like to formally introduce them. Tim was driven by a lifelong love of nature to a career in horticulture. He graduated from the Kishwaukee College Horticulture Program in 1987, followed by a one-year horticulture internship at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Since 1989, Tim has worked and studied at AJG under the direction of Mr. Hoichi Kurisu of Kurisu International, where he is currently garden curator. Tim is a frequent contributor to Sukiya Living Magazine and has presented at national conferences for Najka, of which he is a past member of the board of directors. In 2001, Tim completed the Kyoto University of Art and Design two-week intensive garden symposium in Kyoto, Japan. In 2016, he completed the intensive tea garden rock setting workshop at the International Japanese Garden Training Center at the Portland Japanese Garden. Tim also studies Shano Yu under Professor Kimiko Gunji, Professor Emeritus of Japanese Arts and Culture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Dr. Kendall Brown is Professor of Asian Art History at California State University, Long Beach. He publishes actively in several areas of Japanese art, as well as on Japanese style gardens in North America. He has also curated exhibitions for several American museums exploring topics from woodblock prints and art deco to lacquer makers tools. He was also a co-founder and past president of Najka and served on our board from 2012 to 2017. Welcome Tim and Ken. Well, thank you uh, Marisa for the, the kind introduction as always. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, just to be part of this uh, wonderful program that uh, 30 years ago when I started to study Japanese gardens in America, I could only have dreamt that we would have had such a thing as Najga and we'd have 200 people uh, turning in each week to learn about the history of Japanese gardens and to hear such fabulous histories about so many compelling gardens. So today, Tim and I are going to, uh, Tim will do most of the talking. I'm going to be kind of the interlocutor, questioner, and commenter. Uh, because about four or five years ago, um, I started a project on the history of the Japanese gardens at Anderson. The gardens, the gardeners, the social outreach, that's unpublished. But Tim was kind enough then on my various trips to Rockford uh, to, to interview people uh, that we'll meet in today's lecture uh, to dig out a lot of archives and photo and set up interviews. And it was just a, a great project and hopefully will be published sometime. So with that said, um, as we're going to see, um, Anderson Gardens is in many ways the story of two men, John Anderson and Hoichi Kurisu. And it's a story over four, that has unfolded slowly, seasonally, almost every spring and uh, autumn for the first 30 years, in that kind of gradual evolution or an organic process of garden making, garden remaking, garden editing. Um, but before that partnership started, there was, this is the Anderson Garden. It was on the backyard of the Anderson house. There was one man, John Anderson. So starting there, Tim, how does John Anderson become interested in Japan of, of all places from Rockford, Illinois? It's, it's pretty far away in a pretty foreign culture. Indeed. Uh... Um, a son of, uh, of parents who both, uh, uh, whose parents themselves were both uh, uh, immigrants from, from Sweden. So we've got this Japanese garden in Rockford, Illinois, um, built by uh, a person of a Swedish heritage. It's an unusual and interesting occurrence. Um, but the, the Anderson family had been in the uh, packaging, building machines that, that, that packaged things. And 
milk products was one of the one of the primary um, things that they that, that, that they that they did. They built machines that packaged milk products, and um, it was on uh, um, that. So that kind of was the groundwork for for where we ended up. And it was uh, um, John graduated from. Uh, the University of Wisconsin in 1966, and uh, uh, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and um, the deal was that uh, when he graduated, that uh, his his parents offered to send him anywhere in the world that he wanted um, for six weeks, and um, because of the family's connection with Japan, um, he selected Japan, and so um, that trip. Uh, first, just let me mention real quick: this is a, the overview of the site, the 12-acre site that you see on the screen. With the Anderson House still still in place here, this is a 2000 early 2006 uh, image. But we'll see more images that um, I'll give a little more detailed description about um, sort of the layout of the place and uh, and so forth. But uh, um, so it, it was uh, the, uh, a family family friends the uh, the the Onos of uh, of the Morinaga Milk Company in Japan and. Um, about the same age as John, uh, the, the uh, president of uh, Morinaga Milk, uh, Mr. Akira Ono. Um, Mr. Ono uh, toured Japan, spent six weeks showing showing John um, and, a, and another friend um, the intricacies of, of Japanese culture. Um, uh, John fell in love with the, the arts of Japan, the people, um, the, the service, uh, of of the of of people in Japan and and then uh, really uh, above all the the gardens of Ch Japan. Um, John has said in the past that the gardens of Japan, um, in his words, touched my soul and encouraged my spirit. And so that was a a really significant uh, event in his life. And uh, in effect, the seed was planted for uh, the creation of a Japanese garden at some point. So in the mid-70s, uh, John and his wife, Linda Anderson, I guess they'd gone back to Japan in 73. They've bought this house just out uh, across the Rock River from downtown Rockford, and they've got a backyard. And there's some, you know, what do you do with the lower part of the, the property? Um, so uh, some kind of idea to maybe turn it into a Japanese garden, but, but how? So there's the trip that John Anderson takes to Portland, a business trip. The meeting finishes quickly, and he's got some time to kill before the flight. Uh, and that's maybe the, how this seed gets germinated. That, that's right. And it was, it was on that trip, uh, you know, a really a serendipitous event. Uh, John went to the Portland Japanese Garden, had never been there before. And kind of those uh, the feelings of uh, of, the, of of tranquility, the the calmness that he experienced in the gardens of Japan um, really swept back over him, and um, he was very much inspired to um, find a way to bring someone to Rockford, Illinois, in the middle of North America, uh, to to help him kind of create his dream of having that kind of tranquil space in his own backyard, and. Uh, so it was there, um, inspired by Portland's garden, that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, found uh, the name of uh, Huichi Kurisu, who had been the second director of the Portland Garden, uh, 1968 to 1972, I believe. And uh, uh, you know, the, it's a it's an interesting story. Uh, 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 John uh, contacted Huichi's office, uh, wanted to talk to him. Um, as soon as possible about the the idea of coming to Rockford and uh, and and looking at the space and seeing it, uh, what he thought about building a garden um, and one thing led to the next and by night in the fall of 1978 um, Hoichi was on a was on a plane to Rockford to take a look at the site. I think Hoichi told me that uh, bef you know he was sort of testing John Anderson out a little and sent him some articles, which he, yeah. from based on relations with previous clients, he didn't expect John to read. And when John had read them and called him up and asked a bunch of questions, Hoichi told me then you know he he had a pretty good feeling about this project that something told him this might turn into something big. And as we're going to see, you know, this kind of fateful cab ride and phone conversation 
uh, payphone conversation, you know, hard to think of now at the airport led to something remarkable. And I guess just at the beginning, what has always struck me as somebody visiting the Anderson Garden and many others over the years is that the relationship between these two men, that it explains the kind of the how and the why of this remarkable garden. And then the bigger picture, it offers all of us, I think, lessons about slow growth, sustained growth, and the kind of uh, what is sustainable growth. So let's let's explore this relationship and how this garden grows in the into the remarkable product step by step, and maybe what lessons we can pull out of it at, at the end. Yeah, indeed, it was a long, slow growth, and um, the first uh, the first step forward, um, 1978. Um, this is a a more recent uh, uh, aerial view of the garden space. Um, this is the location of the Anderson home. This was their, this was their backyard. And it was a, it was a pond that, um, uh, had been on the property at least, at least since the, I saw an aerial view of 1935 when this was very, very rural. Um, you can see, um, following the cursor, there is a, a perennial stream, Spring Creek, running through the property. Um, the Rock River is just off screen to the left. Um, a major uh, tributary to the uh, the, uh, the Mississippi River, and uh, um, so it was here where this uh, swampy backyard existed, and um, a view of the of what would become the garden and uh, from shots taken before construction began. So these are these are pre nineteen seventy eight. I think this is a nineteen seventy two picture, uh, the time when the land was, some of the land was purchased. Um, but this is an area we'll see later at what became the East Waterfall. So uh, pretty humble beginning. Um, a, a second growth, uh, overgrown wet area at the edge of a, of a, of a creek. Um, at the base of a slope, uh, a woodland, an oak and hickory uh, covered woodland forest uh, on the slope. And so this was really where it all started. A place where local teenagers, I think John and Linda Anderson told me, would come, drink beer, hang out, make out. So really, um, to, to go from here to, to what we will see in a few minutes is a remarkable transformation at, at many levels. Yeah, and so um, the process, Sahuichi's uh, arrival, um, it was a really different than any, any kind of uh, sort of landscape construction that anyone around here had likely ever seen. Um, basically, uh, the procedure went something like this. Um, you can see the, uh, the conceptual sketches in the top of the screen. Um, and then, uh, and that's basically, uh, Hoichi would create conceptual sketches. Um, he would explain them to John and John would have some input. Sometimes Hoichi would uh, redraw and uh, reconsider the space. Um, that would go back and forth for a while until they were both comfortable with, with what the plan was. And so then with just a conceptual sketch, Hoichi armed with uh, um, one of these uh, paint marker guns, um, then goes out into the landscape and begins laying it out. So it was really a, a design on the ground kind of process. Um, there really were no blueprints of any kind. It was just, uh, um, here's the space, this is the idea, let's go build it. And so that's really how things progressed and that's how they, They've been here since the beginning. Uh, you know, there there were uh, you know there were things to learn along the way, both uh, both on the part of John and uh, and part of and on the part of Hoichi. Uh, this climate is uh, significantly more difficult than the Pacific Northwest. We uh, we get extremely cold winters. We had a uh, two winters ago, the winter of 2019, we had minus 31 Fahrenheit. Um, we get very hot summers, very hot and humid summers, very cold and dry winters. And um, so Huichi had never built anything in a, in a climate like this. John didn't have any real, uh, real deep understanding of what a Japanese garden was and, 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 how the, and really how the materials worked. Um, he knew they made him feel great, but uh, there was, it was a process. One of the, one of the really great stories is, uh, is of this, uh, this pine right here that you see in the upper right hand corner. Um, a Japanese, it was actually an Austrian pine that was planted in the, in the Anderson's front yard. 
And, um, you know, one of the things John wanted Hoichi to do was to get rid of that eyesore. It had some, some quirky movement and really wasn't a picture perfect tree. But Hoichi saw uh, potential in that tree. It had nice lines and nice movement. And so that, that, that sort of uh, object of scorn, if you will, that was slated to be removed, uh, was moved to the garden and became really one of the, one of the stars of that space. And, uh, um, and so that was a, 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 an important thing for John to see that um, sometimes things that are imperfect uh, have a, a kind of beauty to them that um, can't be, uh, you know, that, that equals more than something that you might think is perfect. And so as time went on, the appreciation for, for that idea um, really manifested itself in this logo right here which is, uh, became the logo of, John, of John's company. And uh, so it's really a, a sort of a neat, a, a neat thing that happened. And there, there are so many stories of that kind and, and one can imagine, and it came through in interviewing John and Hoichi, that you know, the gradually they developed the trust. You know, now we look back on 40 years, but at the time it was you know, a dance where they sort of got to know each other and to know each other's moves. Uh, along the way. So part of that learning curve must have been, you know, that Hoichi developing his vision step by step and, and John developing the trust for him. Uh, Hoichi told me once, he asked John at this point, how far do you want to go? And John said, I don't know, but let's see. Yeah. And then that, and then that backyard, that backyard project then proceeded to spiral out of control, some might say, but um, um, into a wonderful thing. Um, so if, uh, returning to the garden in 1979, uh, um, Hoichi began um, work around the perimeter of the pond and then also um, on construction of the first waterfall that you see in the upper left. And um, you'll see, all, and then in the upper right is a, um, a much later, more mature rendition. But that project with the, uh, with the, the waterfall that sits uh, Oh, I don't know, maybe 15 feet in elevation above the garden, um, and then the water, the waterfall, and then there's a winding stream that splits into two with an island. Um, when the Andersons saw that, uh, you know, they thought we we knew we we have the right guy. This is a guy that is uh, making our dream and our and uh, you know what we had hoped for really really come true, and. Oh. Uh, Although it's still their backyard and there are it photos, is. I don't think you have them, but of, of the kids, Anderson kids playing, you know, hockey on the frozen over pond in the yeah. winter and rowing canoes on it in the summer. And I guess hockey pucks are still found at the bottom of it. That is a fact. Yeah, we used to maintain the ice for the kids back when we were, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was the Anderson's backyard. That was one of, one of the jobs the maintenance crew did. Um, it was great fun to do that too. Um, but uh um, things began to really kind of gel, and um, it was sometime in that in that era when Hoichi asked John, you know, do you realize the purpose of our work in making this garden? Um, one thing for certain, it is not for your glory or for mine. And so, sort of like the idea had been, you know, presented that um, the garden can be can be much more than just. Uh, a pretty place and it's not about ego. It is about um, really benefiting um, not only the Anderson family, but um, maybe even the, the community at large and, uh, you know, and then as it turns out, uh, you know, uh, regionally. Um, so we went uh, from this pretty, pretty simple beginning and you see these early, early images of the uh, pond construction um, the photo uh, from June of 1979. Um, that really was the beginning of what became um, a collaboration that has gone on since 1978. And um, there's a few images of John and Hoichi together, the 1984 guest house construction, uh, the 19, uh, excuse me, the 2006 um, visitor center, and as well as the 2006 uh, Canyon Stream reroute. Um, so it was a it was a marvelous. It's been a marvelous collaboration that has um, really generated some remarkable space that has benefited the community um, in a huge way. 
And I have a few images to, uh, to share um, of uh, the pond strolling garden and the, 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 uh, the Yatsuhashi. The uh, the moon bridge in the in the pond strolling garden, looking towards the the original gate where where um, where all the garden traffic came through. The Anderson Anderson's house was was up here on the slope, looking down over the garden. And so initially, all the tours came right next to their house um, through an area we call the Canyon Waterfall, and uh, through that that main gate. And I guess the bathrooms in their house were where the uh, tourists would, would, would use as they came on bus trips. That is correct. And uh, an, another interesting tidbit is that the, uh, the gardeners actually worked out of a closet on the back of the house. So it was a pretty, a pretty humble beginning. But by the early 1980s, uh, things had really started to gain traction in terms of uh, public awareness. Um, nothing, nothing had been built like this in this area ever before. And uh, you know, garden clubs were beginning to take notice, um, local enthusiasts, uh, culture enthusiasts. And uh, here uh, in the early 1980s is uh, um, John's wife, Linda, um, with a tour of Cub Scouts uh, touring the garden. And it's at John, so Linda, Linda plays a huge role in, in all of what has happened here. Um, not only was she the first tour guide, but with all the construction crews that came from, uh, from Carisu International in Portland, Oregon, and then, you know, eventually from Japan with uh, Hamada Masahiro, the woodworker that built uh, the guest house and other structures, she really was the keeper of the Anderson Inn, which is the Anderson's house where um, often the entire crew of Hoichi's guys, sometimes maybe a half a dozen guys would, would stay in their house and Linda would take care of um, feeding them and, 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 uh, and making sure that they had everything they needed to be comfortable while they worked at the garden. So there's really a team, you know, uh, this team between, uh, within the Anderson family, the Andersons and the Kurisus, and then Kurisu International Company and, and his team. That's right. Even the Kurisu kids came to the garden um, over the years when they were young and um, spent long periods of time here with, uh, with the Anderson kids. So uh, really a, a marvelous uh, mingling of families and getting to know each other and uh, sharing their lives together, really. So that momentum is, you know, there's now, you know, energy and momentum in the garden and the human communities, and it's pushing forward. And John Anderson is thinking maybe, you know, the community is part of it, his business is growing, connections with Japan. And so the, the push to, to enlarge the garden out of that initial pond. Yeah, indeed. And uh, the next thought was uh, some kind of a Japanese structure, some kind of a building that they could use to um, entertain and, um, and then, uh, you know, really um, have a, a more a fuller expression of, of what a Japanese garden can be. And that led to the guest house project of 1984. And uh, um, a pretty significant undertaking um, in this country really at any time. Um, but um, the project was uh, significant in a lot of ways. Um, the Huichi uh, traveled to Japan with the Andersons um, in 1983. And it was there um, and this this is a this is just a beautiful image. There's uh there's a uh, Huichi and uh, John and um, uh, the great Kenzo Ogata and uh, um, uh, Mr. Ogawa, who was the uh, architect of the guest house, and uh, Mr. Ogawa's assistant. So um, you know we we talk a lot about about Huichi, and we we've, we've heard about. Uh, Ken, the, the, from, from Sada in his talk about the Portland Garden, um, here's Kenzo Ogata himself, um, a, a great teacher and uh, um, just a, an amazing garden builder. And so with the plans uh, put together, uh, the foundations began to go into the built for the building in 1984. Um, also in 1984, the garden hired its first uh, full-time uh, garden manager, Michael Elena, who went on to become um, garden, the first garden curator. Um, and it was, uh, 
it was really, um, it was a beautiful process of uh, communicating between the, the, the needs of uh, Hamada Masahiro right here, the, uh, the woodworker um, that built this structure, um, local, a local uh, a carpenter, um, Michael Elena right here, and, um, and a translator. And you can see that there's some, some people are trying really hard to communicate in this image. And there was some difficulty. Um, you know, not only language barrier, but the translator didn't know construction terms. And so there were a lot of uh, hand gestures and drawing and um, over time things, uh, things were figured out. But uh, the Hamada, Mr. Hamada and his assistant, um, uh, Mr. Takahashi, they were here for six months working on this guest house, all the while living at the Anderson's residence. Um, you can see in this picture the the um, all the the, the 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 posts and beams were cut um, over a period of six weeks at the at the garden maintenance shop. Here you can see the structure beginning to rise. Um, in the meantime, Hoichi is overseeing the construction of the garden space around the guest house. Um, the ridge pole ceremony with um, uh, Masahiro Hamada and uh, uh, Mr. Takahashi, his assistant. Uh, Mr. Anderson and, and his father, Ralph Anderson. And uh, so um, Ralph Anderson, a key player in all of this. Uh, um, he's the guy that uh, made a lot of things happen uh, with the Japanese in business. Um, and uh, without him, there is no Japanese garden here in Rockford. And so the guest house presented a whole lot of whole bunch of lessons too. And one of the more, one of the more prominent ones was, <clears throat> was, uh, the copper roof and you can see that this is a copper roof in disarray and uh um local 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 craftsmen were putting the copper shingles on the building it's a it's a copper and uh um and tile roof and you know john could see that maybe things weren't going right and he could see that mr hamada was not comfortable with what was happening with the shingles and, but Mr. Hamada wouldn't say anything. And so um, it took a very direct conversation with what's wrong? Why, why are you not happy with this? Uh, Hamada didn't want to say anything bad about another trade. Um, but the reality was the roof wasn't going right. And so it was a, an important lesson in communication and that um, if we need to be clear with each other, even though we're from different cultures, what is happening here? Um, if something's wrong, you need to tell us. We don't know, uh, and so this was a, an important lesson as as time went on for keeping lines of communication very clear. So, all as I understand it, all of the copper is pulled off, trashed, that is, and then that is correct. Is it was all sent to a um, to a scrapyard. So, the lesson also, uh, I think, for John Anderson, you know, to do things right, it takes time and it takes more money than you thought. But doing it right <laughs> is the larger point. Yeah, that's a common theme. Um, probably with anything, that's great. Uh, so things progressed. Um, garden work going on. Here you can see the copper going back on. The tiles are stacked on the roof. Um, later on, the landscape uh, being installed, uh, a pine tree being lifted in by a crane. Um, things uh, later, years later, things... Uh, maturing um, around the guest house. Um, it's really become a very, a very special, very special building um, that we use for quite a number of things. Um, a shot from the, the upper room with its own uh, tokonoma, uh, often this area is used uh, where guests would sleep um, that came to the garden, but <clears throat> we also use it uh, uh, for tea ceremony now. And I think so it's- uh, yeah, and John Anderson also wanted to use it for Japanese culture. I, there is a wonderful photo of him uh, doing tea there uh, when the garden, when the building is inaugurated, and using it for business as well. Part of this lesson, the lesson as you talked about, the being learning from Japan, the commitment to doing things right, to taking care of your guests and your business relationships, and the garden tea house is sort of becoming a symbol of that. That, that, that is the, the guest house. Excuse me. That is right. The guest house became a symbol of that. And actually the first, the first tea ceremony in the garden occurred in, in this room 
Um, it was a bowl of tea prepared by um, Masahiro Hamada, the woodworker's wife, um, who, who practiced tea. And so um, it happened first in this room. Um, and uh, yeah, that attention to detail, and that's something that John spoke a lot about, is that that sort of that uh, culture of hospitality that he uh, experienced in Japan and, and really wanted to uh, relay to the people around us here in the garden. So another lesson is that Mike Eleanor, who's there as sort of the full-time person and his brother is also working seasonally, that they're really learning about Japanese garden design and maintenance and culture. And so a, a team locally is, is, is coming to, to a kind of maturity. Yeah, that is, that is right. That was one of the beautiful things about this entire project was when Huichi came to the garden to work, um, everyone that everyone that worked here was a part of that was a part of that process. We were the guys digging holes, um, you know, pushing boulders. Uh, you know, we also made runs to the hardware store, got the materials for Hoichi, whatever it took. Um, you know, so we were in effect getting a. Um, it was a. It was a kind of. A, it was really an internship. You know, it was a kind of a traditional style internship that happened typically in two week periods, you know, over the course of, of years. And uh, so that, that was, uh, that's been, I think, important in um, getting us to where we are now that the crew became uh, integrated into the thinking of Hoichi. Hmm. So the guest house was used uh, um, initially uh, quite a lot for um, business meetings. Um, here's an early meeting in the guest house with with John down here in the corner, um, conducting business. Um, and then, and also, um, at, I mean, at that time that we had a, a chef that made uh, beautiful Japanese style food. Um, it was a, if, if you wanted to show people your commitment to business uh, and to quality, um, the guest house was a remarkable way to do that. Um, it's now uh, in, in, in current times, um, the building is used for our, um, Anderson Japanese Garden Tea Study Group um, with, uh, uh, guided by Professor Kimiko Gunji of the University of Illinois, Professor Emeritus of uh, Japanese Cultural Arts there and founder of uh, Champagne's Japan House. Um, so here she is conducting uh, um, a study session with, uh, with a group of students that up until the time of COVID, we, we, met, um, we met really twice a month for eight to nine months of the year um, to study tea. Uh, we went we went virtual last year with uh, with a Zoom study. We hope to get back to normal this year. But anyway, also other cultural events for the public. Um, and this in this slide, uh, one of uh, Professor Gunji's assistants, uh, David Munganas from Milwaukee, um, is uh, talking about the life of uh, Seno Riku, um, the great tea master of the 16th century, and um, you know so important in so many ways and. Uh, tea style and the style of architecture and so forth. Um, but here we are, we have uh, um, this, this memorial uh, honorary service to uh, um, um, honor Seno Riku. And uh, from, the upper, from the upper area, a view of the, of the uh, uh, Karisan Sui, which is a, a little atypical and uh, um, in that it's uh, not uh, not built behind walls. Uh, um, there's an Ngawa at the guest house that looks out over this space. Um, it's unusual in that there's a stream um, running through uh, the, the backside of the garden. It walls off, this planting walls, walls the garden off from the main path around the pond strolling garden. Um, so it's become a, a really beautiful space that, um, you know, people really love to uh, sit, enjoy, relax and, and view this garden. It's always struck me also as something a kind of Midwestern in a way, and, and that Hoichi is aware that he's, you know, connecting to the, there's a sense of like the flow and the wind and the stream down the hill. Yeah. Uh, and that sense of uh, kind of adapting Japanese garden principles and those specifically from his teacher, Ogata, to this space. And it's such a, a, an unusual but lovely and delicate way. The photos, good as they are, don't bring that out. But that, that sense of Hoichi now really connecting with his crew, with the crew in Rockford. I think your next photo that you'd already gone yeah. to brings that out yeah. into the specific place. 
Yeah, indeed, indeed. So the the gardeners were, you know, cutting their teeth on this training and working with Hoichi. Um, here is uh, John and Hoichi on a break, a break from work uh, uh, during the guest house project. Uh, here's Michael Elena's brother, Mark. Um, you know, you know, another. So all three guys that were working here at that time. Um, Michael, Michael was a potter. Um, he had spent time at the School of the Art Institute as a ceramic tech in Chicago. Mark was a fine art painter um, and a you know, really talented guy. And then another guy you'll see a little bit later was another local uh, craftsman, artist, sculptor, woodworker. Um, and so it was really a, a bunch of really uh, inspired people who were further inspired by the work that they were seeing being done here at Anderson Gardens. And indeed, more projects uh, develop. The, the sort of momentum grows from the initial pond garden with the small yeah. waterfall to the pavilion with, with all of it, the learning curve. Everybody's pretty satisfied. And so it's always struck me if you, I think, uh, that sense of what happens next, which is a yeah. pretty bold move. But it's really predicated on Hoichi uh, kind of connecting with the team, it seems, there and feeling comfortable. That's right. That's right. Over time, there was a lot of trust built between the people working here. You know, when you have when you have five ton boulders hanging over your head uh, from a crane, um, you want to know that you're working in a safe environment around people that you can trust. And uh, and so over time, there was a great camaraderie built between the people working together. It's uh, it was kind of like it was kind of like going to battle together. Um, and the, the 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 battle was to build something beautiful. Um, I just want to maybe a uh, couple of notes uh, on that, that idea of the, of the ongoing training by, by doing. Um, here's a shot of uh, the main gate project in 2000 and 2005. Um, and these are, these are all guys, these are some of the guys on, on the crew here. Uh, Doug and Ian and Todd, uh, they all had a, you know, we helped build it. Uh, and so we got to see, we, you know, Luigi didn't always have time to explain why he was doing things, but we got to see him doing things and in the process, dissect it between ourselves. And, um, you know, we know what it meant to, to set a rock and, and, uh, to, to, and how important it was for Hoichi to, you know, dial it in very carefully and accurately so that it was just sitting in the right posture to deflect energy in just the right direction. And so what a, what a marvelous, what a marvelous uh, internship for all of us. And you know that he's, and I think your next slides show this, you know, that he's come, we'll see him older and younger, that he's yeah. coming back every year. The, as some That's people right. called it, the Ho Hoichi tornado blows into Rockford every spring, every fall. And, and that is, is a right. great chance to learn. Yeah, it was, um, it was an intense whirlwind of activity at, at, at every one of those visits because we had a lot to accomplish with not a lot of time sometimes. And so um, every minute was meaningful. And um, so we all pushed hard. Uh, and so, um, you know, as time went on, Hoichi, Hoichi began to explain, you know, his vision more thoroughly to us when, when uh, for example, in the, uh, the images that you see here, um, when Huichi would come back to uh, train us into uh, with, with with pruning techniques, and um, most of it was uh, about visual energy and um, kind of how things would flow. Here you can see um, in this sketch. This is actually a loose sketch of the East Waterfall, and he is illustrating the kise or kind of like directional force um, that the plants, the rocks, and the water. Um, all exhibit, and when they when they work together cohesively, um, the space has a kind of uh, harmony to it. And so we were fortunate to be um, able to witness his lectures, and um, <clears throat> then we'd go out into the garden, and he might sketch a tree and um, think of what it would look like without certain branches or uh, at a different height. Um, we have a very absorptive crew that um, was extremely anxious to learn. Um, and then uh, out into the garden we'd go. And um, here's Hoichi. Um, he actually has a sketch pad um, you can't see, um, talking to the crew about, you know, what's next for this tree? Well, speaking so of what, 
what's next. The, uh, the, the, you know, the garden to this point in 1988 is still pretty small and, yeah. and natural, and, but there's going to be a big, bold, audacious move that happens in 88, 89 with the West Waterfall. That's right. And uh, that takes us, this takes us up to that point. The next big project was the West Waterfall project. And then uh, slightly later, the, the uh, adjoining uh, tea house project. And I think Ken has uh, mentioned uh, what an audacious project it was. Um, here, just to give you an idea of the site, Pond Strolling Garden over here, Guest House is right here. The Anderson House was right here. It was raised in 2008. Here's the West Waterfall. Here's the tea house. At that time, virtually none of this land belonged to the Andersons. So um, this in effect, in this circle, this was the garden. So West Waterfall, um, an outrageous undertaking. Um, uh, uh, this is the final conceptual sketch. Things were batted around uh, for quite a long time, a number of different concepts um, with possible structures, um, tea house, um, this azumaya, this round azumaya. Um, but this was the final conceptual drawing uh, of, that, of that project. And there really were no other, the only thing blueprinted on this whole thing, the only thing that was engineered was, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but just to back, I'll back up a little bit. This is the site before construction started, Michael Allen on, Hoichi Kurisu, um, Hoichi laying things out. Uh, Mark, uh, Mike supplying uh, the equipment to do that. Um, Hoichi overseeing the excavation. This was in 1988. And then uh, fall of 88, this steel wall that you see here um, was erected, driven into the earth, sheet piling, um, major steel work and major concrete work also. And I remember this is when I started working at the garden was right here. So I started in March of 1980, uh, 1989. And I remember looking, seeing Hoichi standing at the base of this fall, and I thought, wow, what a, what a massive thing. How, how does the guy f face that without, you know, but he was so calm through the whole thing. Um, it was really quite, uh, quite a remarkable thing to be a part of and, and to witness. And here, um, as, the, as, the boulders, as the boulders grew on this wall, as we stacked them up, there were a total of 30 days of boulder setting um, over the over three two week periods, um, here's little Timmy Gruner right here, um, fresh out, fresh out of horticulture school uh, and ready to go. And one of my another one of the three original gardeners, Jim Jolene, uh, um, a really great mentor of mine and a marvelous artist and um, sculptor and uh, an incredible engineer as well. Um, so what an amazing thing to work with all these incredibly talented people. I fell into a into a dream world really. So that project um, really took the bulk of 1989 in, 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 uh, in spurts. Um, by 19, uh, the spring of 1990, um, the, water, the pumps were installed, the waterfall was operational. We had spent uh, a big chunk of the spring uh, planting that space. And then by the fall of uh, quite some years later, um, things more mature, um, this is a, 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 a good a good idea of what the place looks like in the fall. Really matured. It looks like it's been here forever. And it, just to think back to that original photo you showed us, where there's a hillside, not mm -hmm. a, a waterfall, not a stream, not, not a trickle, and to turn into this. But it always struck me as as bold as this is relative to what had come before. That Hoichi and John signing off on it, literally signing the the design sketch is going to balance this bold waterfall and large new west pond with a very delicate tea house and stream. Indeed, indeed. And um, that actually uh, came to fruition in, uh, in late uh, spring of 1990. Um, earlier that spring, uh, Hoichi and the garden crew, including myself, uh, built this boulder wall that retains the slope um, this is that big slope with the oak and hickory forest that I talked about earlier. Um, that slope was cut, uh, flat spot made, um, tea house structure going up. Um, what an incredible thing to watch the skilled craftsmen from Japan fitting posts to uh, cobblestones um, uh, that, sitting on top of piers that, that anchor the building to the ground. Um, a, remarkable, a remarkable event and an amazing thing to witness. 
And so think about this scene in 1990. Um, some years later, I think this, this, this photo was taking, taken a couple of years ago. Uh, the space mature looks like it's been there so long. It has such an amazing feel. And when you think about the, the calmness of this tea garden and this slight, and this little stream running past it, um, the way Hoichi built that, that, that west waterfall, um, the sound of that waterfall is projected away from this space. And so the soundscape is remarkable walking from the tea, from the tea garden uh, to the West Waterfall. Um, this is looking towards the West Waterfall, but it sits behind this lobe of land right here um, on the other side of the trees. You barely hear it at all or really don't even know it's there. And, and all of this without a master plan, the, the sense of Indeed. time. So, you know, people often ask, was there a master plan? Even there really point, was, you know, 10 years in? There really wasn't. Um, and and things, things kind of evolved like this. Uh, um, Hoichi did sketches, the garden new space was built. Um, then um, this is as close to a master plan as you might see. And this is uh, um, this particular drawing uh, was the result of acquisition of more property. Um, the Anderson home, again, sat here. It was raised in, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, it was raised in 2008. Um, but s these properties that uh, bordered the garden on the south um, were purchased uh, 1991, 1994. These were all private residences, two, 1998 and the year 2000. Um, so... Little by little, the garden uh, began to have opportunities for more growth. And um, one of the structures uh, that was uh, uh, part of the, one of those properties um, was this outrageous uh, um, pyramidal house that was converted into a, a visitor center, um, an education center. And uh, it worked really well. Um, it, it, it itself was raised in 2002 um, due to some significant structural issues. Um, this image shows the, the space just after the cloverleaf was built. Um, so this is where the visitor center is uh, right here now. So you can see our proximity to the Rock River. So the next major project is now we're at, we've, we've jumped Spring Creek. We're, we're way right. beyond the Anderson backyard that we're really now conceiving of Anderson Japanese Gardens as a public garden and a desire to sort of in a way move not away from Japan, but to not have a kind of pure or authentic Japanese garden in this new area. So the, yeah. as you're showing us, the Garden of Reflection is, is an expansion physically and kind of conceptually. Yeah, There's that no is Japanese right. Japanese lanterns here. And um, it's a garden uh, that we think of as a, a contemporary garden with strong Japanese influence. And um, really this garden, a major intent of this garden was to be a, gar a, a, a space for, for public events. Um, uh, we had been doing uh, weddings on a small scale. Um, it was an opportunity to raise uh, funds uh, via weddings and also um, have festivals and other things. Um, the garden was controversial in that um, there was the addition of these uh, um, bronze angels by the Swedish sculptor Carl Millis. Um, but, you know, Hoichi's thought was that, you know, these, these had been purchased by John and Linda Anderson um, to, uh, you know, out of honor, to honor their, their Swedish heritage. And, uh, you know, Hoichi, John wanted to put them somewhere in the city. Uh, Hoichi said, why not here? And, you know, the, these angels that are um, really, um, you know, bearers of good, goodwill and good tiding, um, and that became the Garden of Reflection, which reflected um, in Hoichi's thinking um, the best of who we are. And so um, in this Garden of Reflection, um, you know, really, there, it, was a, it was a big effort. Uh, um, here is Hoichi, um, Toro Tanaka, who um, you heard of uh, his efforts at the Portland Garden, uh, um, another one of Ogata's um, students um, did work here. Um, along with um, these three guys um, who came, whoops, sorry, came here as part of Hoichi's crew. Um, 
and uh, really talented guys themselves and incredibly hard workers. And it's interesting to know that behind the scenes, uh, working out of the Portland office, was uh, Sada Fumi Uchiyama, who um, worked for Huichi um, from, I think, 1994 until 2003, I think. Two or three. I think one of the things that Sada and the crew in Portland is working on is, is in part how to, to tie this new garden back to the older garden on the other side of Spring Creek. And so flow plans, a bridge that needs to now lead between the, the two sides. Yeah, that's right. And um, so the garden, uh, now that we have this creek, we needed a linkage. Um, this, this, gate, this bridge was designed by Huichi. Um, it was installed in 2002 with uh, a little more formal with the giboshi. Um, and then that, in turn, um, it led to the other side of the garden, but um, Huichi really desired a more kind of a, a clear transition between this contemporary garden, the garden of reflection, and the more traditional garden of the guest house, the pond strolling garden, the tea house, and the west waterfall. Um, and then the main gate projects came along, and that was that transition point, uh, the separation between the two styles of gardens. And so at this point, um, really the, the current flow or the, the contemporary flow of the garden um, emerged. We now uh, will soon have, there. we were using an, uh, a two-story Cape Cod house as a visitor center at that, by that time, um, tour traffic, left the visitor center, um, wandered through the Garden of Reflection, um, across the Giboshi Bridge, now through the uh, main gate. Um, the, our guests uh, through a small gate on the south end of the Pond Strolling Garden, around through the guest house inner garden to see the Karik Sansui, um, through this little mountain path, tea house, west waterfall, across another bridge that was added, around the Garden of Reflection, and back to the Visitor Center. It's about a mile walk uh, in total. The, the total site now covers uh, 12 acres. So, you know, you can see that there were ongoing additions of space and new gardens, um, and always, as always, ongoing editing. And uh, editing was a constant. Whenever a new space was created, you know, that new, that new space pulls on the fabric of everything around it. And so there needed to be subtle and sometimes not so subtle changes in existing garden spaces that often were wonderful spaces, but um, they didn't quite fit with the new, with the new, um, with the new uh, presence of, of, of new spaces. And so here's an example of Hoichi working on um, the Canyon Creek that flows behind the guest house. It came down next to the Anderson's house, down the hill, behind the guest house, and feeds the, bit, the west waterfall pond. Um, but because of the, the way the, the new space laid out and the guests came through the gate, um, Hoichi bumped this creek way out into what was the driveway. It used to flow behind this tree right here. It used to flow behind there. So bumped way out, made the space much more interesting. So again, uh, the space was edited greatly to receive the new component, the main gate. I think gate. that's really a key thing, you know, in the, in the big lessons uh, to take from the history of the Anderson Gardens is with all of the slow incremental change, add on, add on, revision, there's always the sense of going back and improving the, the older parts. That's right. Yeah. And we are, we are still doing that to this day. Um, you know, something too, just uh, um, in, in a certain kind of addition and editing, we've been adding lot, lots more benches in the garden. And, you know, we, a lot of elderly uh, guests come through and we want them to be comfortable. So um, the early design had quite a number of benches out there, but we've been adding more and more here in a, in a small area that Hoichi termed as uh, uh, the uh, conversation areas. So the intent was to make these uh, small areas um, very private, um, quiet, where people could sit, um, reflect, um, enjoy quiet conversation with the people with them, or read a book, or whatever. But places of contemplation and conversation. So, and also for rest, uh, yeah. uh, people need a break. I guess the big picture is visitor experience is driving the design. That's right. Yep. Yeah, we wanna be, in effect, we wanna be good hosts. 
and we want our guests to feel comfortable and relaxed. And if they if they need to stop and take a break, we want to we want to create that that opportunity for them. But there so, are needs to 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 kind of open up because as wonderful as this garden is, that still many people in Rockford, you know, I don't like sushi. You know, I don't want to see a, a Japanese garden. So the desire to make a kind of public event space is the one thing that remains to be added. Yeah, that's that's right. That's a really that's a really uh, key and good point. In that, um, you know, th this garden, the, the garden of reflection, and then the the addition of the pavilion in 2010. It's a 53 foot square uh, structure. Um, initially, uh, you know, I was against the idea of having music here, but this is I this is the Ken Brown ripple effect, and um, basically, really informing us that gardens were not just places of quiet contemplation, that they were also areas of, of entertainment and celebration. And, uh, and there was music in Japanese gardens. The and, third paragraph of the Sakuteki from you know, the 11th century says, make sure you have a space on your island large enough to house the musicians. That is a key. <laughs> and maybe that was, we maybe forgot, lost track of that in all the years with uh, uh, books that uh, had you know showed monks sitting on and God was staring out at gardens meditating um, and so um, while I was uh, apprehensive about this this whole thing I have to say it became a discovery mechanism for a lot of people uh, in the region and um, you know the other thing uh, something else that uh, I've, I've I've heard Ken say multiple times is that the only people um, in the gardens at noontime were the gardeners um, because it was hot and uncomfortable and it was the evening, it was the twilight when people were out enjoying these spaces. Well, and since we're at about an hour into it, Tim, maybe you could go a little oh. more uh, uh, flash through the next slides, which really show sure. us people in the garden. And as John Anderson once said to me, you know, I don't want to be remembered as the guy who spent a lot of money to build a garden. I want to be remembered as the guy who built a garden that changed people's lives. And you need to bring the people into them, into the garden in diverse ways. Yeah, indeed, uh, through whether it was, uh, um, you know, cultural events like our summer festival, um, culto players, um, a, beer, a beer tasting. Um, it's great fun getting people into the garden um, they, to, to see the space. Um, great communication vector, um, a marvelous thing uh, for everyone. Um, the visitor center and restaurant opened in uh uh, 2007, 2008, um, and with that, uh, um, this is a view actually from where I'm sitting, I can see this very space right now, um, the back side of this building. So I'm sitting right over here, just off screen. Um, this sunken Kari Sansui um, garden with our staff offices, and you can see the chairs sitting here in the restaurant. So from uh, 1983 and one tour guide, Mrs. Anderson, um, we've gone from then to now, 2021, with a team of 70, from one, from one tour guide to, 20, to a team of 70 docents. From around 500 guests in 1983 to um, nearly 50,000 guests in 20, 2020 in the year of COVID, we've been, been averaging about 55,000 guests a year up to that point. Um, we now have eight full-time staff and uh, 35 part-time staff. Um, and as, as we move towards a, um, a, a sort of a, a curriculum of, of health and wellness has really become um, the focus of the work that we do. Tai Chi, um, peacefulness, peacefulness through a bowl of tea and the, the less, many lessons contained in tea ceremony. Uh, workshops. We actually did a, a Najka workshop here uh, two years ago, um, a, regional, a regional event uh, headed by Professor Gunji, um, Kokoro in the Garden, which explored that relationship. We hold grief workshops here, um, collaboration with uh, um, a, a local youth alcohol and substance abuse treatment center, um, which also has a Japanese garden built by Hoichi. Um, and spearheaded by the Anderson family. And, and on that note, the success of it, I know this is anecdotal, but I remember, I'll, I'll never forget it, about four years ago, you and I, Tim, were standing in the garden around 4 p.m., I think it was in August, and a 16-year-old-ish kid comes around the corner and says, 
uh, are, are you Tim, the, the curator? And you said yes. And he said, I, I'm one of the kids who came here with the uh, Rosecrans drug and real uh, drug and alcohol addiction program to work in the garden. I just graduated today. You know, it's 4 p.m. He said, I graduated from two and, and I want you to meet my parents. Is there any way I could work in a garden like this? And it was such a powerful, you know, uh, testimony to, to what this kind of program and work in gardens does. Yeah, that was, that was a beautiful moment. And it's, it's things like that, that, that really drive what we, what we do here. We want to positively affect people's lives, whether they're people with problems that they need to overcome or whether they're people that are doing all right, but just need some fresh insight. Um, we, wanna, we wanna be a part of improving the lives of people. And um, so the garden uh, and its function uh, continues to, to evolve. And um, I hope uh, sometime to see all of you here, here at Anderson Japanese Gardens. And that's that's a uh, that's a wrap on on this program. Thank you, Tim and Ken, for being with us today.